Today, I wanna to talk about the things that Make will do for you automatically, like without even putting things in your Make file, it'll just do stuff, and why that's both really cool and occasionally a little annoying. Welcome back everybody. Today I want to talk a little bit about make files and some of the interesting things about them. It has been a while since I've specifically talked about make files, though they do show up in most of my videos. If you are new to make files, please go check some of my earlier videos. They'll give you some more basic information. But one thing I do want to point out is that in my past videos, almost all of my make files, in the interest of being clear, are very explicit. So all the things that I'm using in those make files, I'm explicitly putting in the make files, all the rules, all the variables, all of that stuff. Today, I want to talk about the things that make does for you that you don't put in the make files, but they're in there anyway. And so I want to go through some examples, look at how this works with some code and how you could use it in your projects. And of course, also how they can make things a little bit confusing. This video will have source code in it. And as always, a huge thanks to all of you who support this channel, especially those who support the channel on Patreon, where you can get access to all the source code for my videos and access to my office hours. A huge thanks for making this channel possible. But now let's dive into the code. Okay, so today I am starting with a super simple program. Hello world once again. This file is called example.c. I have a couple other files that I will touch on later on in this example. For now, you can kind of ignore them. And I also have a make file, but there's nothing in it. Okay, in fact, actually, if we'll make this a little more dramatic, let's just remove the make file entirely. And at this point, so I just have my C code. If I come in here and I type make, not surprisingly, nothing happens. It basically says there's no specified targets and no make file found. And that doesn't surprise anyone because there's no make file here. But what happens if I come in here and I say make example? Well, now you see we have a warning because yeah, hey, I left that in, let's make this real hello world. But the more interesting thing is if I said make example, then it actually did something. And it not only that, but it did something completely sensible. Even without a make file, you notice that it went in and it called my default C compiler CC with my C file and said, let's name it example. So that is really interesting. I was just able to use make without a make file. But let's say that I find it annoying. I don't wanna say make example every time. I just wanna type make. So for this, let's do come in here and create a make file. Okay, so now we have our empty make file and let's just make one little change. Let's come in here and say all, so you're familiar with an all target and let's just say example. So now when I come in here and say make, well, let's remove example and we run make. Now it's gonna compile it just fine and I only had to add one line to my make file. Now, this whole like manual deletion is going to bug me. So I am gonna add just for my own convenience, I'm gonna add a clean target here. And let's just come in here and say RM example. So now I can clean it easy enough. But the point is, is that, you know, even without this clean target, we were getting a lot of mileage out of a make file that had one line. And the question is why? What's going on? Now this feels magical. And so the simple answer is that make actually has a lot of included rules that are built in. And we can use those rules without even writing our own. If we know, for example, that we want to compile a .c file to a binary of the same name, and we're okay with using the default C compiler, and I don't want to supply any compiler flags, then we can just do what I'm doing here and just use the built-in automatic make rule for compiling a .c file to a binary of the same name. Okay, so that's great, but how did I know that? How do I know what these automatic rules are. And the answer to that is pretty simple. If you just come up here, let's give me a little more room. And if I say make dash P, this is going to, well, it tells me a lot. This dumps a lot of information. Um, let's run it again and pipe it into less just so you can see the top. But basically what it's doing is it's giving me, it's telling me, first of all, there's a whole bunch of variables that are defined. So we get all of this information. And then if we come down here, at some point we're going to start to see rules. But yeah, so first we just get tons of variables and these are variables that I can use if I want. And then and if I keep jumping down after a lot of variables, we can get down here where we start to get our rules. And so down here with the rules, now you're starting to see what I'm, what I was talking about, what we're using in this example. For example, right here, you can see there is a rule, a pattern rule that will take something.c and convert it or compile it to a binary of the same name. And right here, I mean, yeah, it's using some variables. This may not be obvious what's going on. We'll go up and look at it in just a second, but this is basically doing what we were doing. And so if we come up, let's see if we can find that link.c. Uh, where is it? 
Okay, so we found it. Here is our link.c variable, and all it does is it combines a bunch of other variables, including cc, which is my C compiler, C flags, which is my C flags, any C++ flags that I might want to add in, some link flags, and then if we want to specify a target architecture, which in this case, I'm not specifying any of these, so it's just using the default values. And of course, as I'm scrolling around, you can also see that there, there are rules for other languages, Fortran, C++, whatever. There, there's a bunch of these rules in here, even LaTeX, just so many rules. And I'll leave you to hunt through this list and see what might be useful to you. But basically, these are the rules that you don't have to actually include in your make file if you want to use them. They're just there by default. But I do want to take just a moment to look at what we can do with some of this predefined stuff. Because we can also customize things a little bit. The structure is actually really useful. For example, I could come up here and let's say that I don't want to use the default C compiler. Let's say I want to use Clang. I can just come in here and say CC equals Clang. And now if I come in and I say make clean and make... Now you notice that it's going to use my CC variable and it will actually use Clang instead of CC. Similarly, I could come up here and let's say that I want to pass in some compiler flags. I could say, let's say dash wall because I want some more warnings and I want debug information to be included. So I do dash G. I might also change the standard and say we want C99. Or let's go with something more recent and do C11. The point is that now if I come down and recompile it, you can see that again, my customizations are showing up in this rule and I still didn't have to write any rules. So that's great, that's really cool. What if we wanted to get a little more complicated? What if we wanna to try to compile a program that has more than one translation unit in it? So for that, I have this additional .h file. It just, it's got if def guards and it has a, a function called test function that's not gonna do much, just returns an int. And then here in our .c file that corresponds, here is the function. Right now it just returns zero. So really nothing fancy here and it includes the .h file, but I just wanna compile this as a separate translation unit and then link them together, which is something that you do as your programs get more complicated, even though this example is still pretty stinking simple. But just to tie these things together, let's come back to example here and let's come in and say we want to include our header file a .h and then down here, let's just add a little percent %d and call our test function like that. Okay, so now our main program example is going to use this function in a.c. And now let's say I wanna compile this whole thing. I can come into my make file here and all I have to do is to make a new target. I'm gonna say example here. And I'm gonna say example depends on a.o, okay? Saying that I wanna compile my .c file to an a.o, and then my example program depends on a.o, it, it's gonna require it. And also just for simplicity, I'm also gonna say star.o in my clean target, so it will clean everything up for me. But now I can come down here and I can say make, and you notice that once again, the built-in rules kick in. They happen to have a rule that knows how to compile a .c file to a .o file pretty nicely right here using my cc and c flags variables that I set. And then it uses that dependency up here and it basically compiles, well, I mean, it links my program together, this a.o and example.c. So it compiles example.c and then links it with a.o. And honestly, that's really cool because I mean, with a fairly minimal make file, I mean, a make file that really doesn't have any compile commands written into it, you know, so, I mean, it says almost nothing except a little bit about dependencies and a little bit about what compiler I want to use and what flags I want to use. And with just this, I'm able to build my program. You know, I can build a program that has multiple different translation units. And so that's really cool. So what's not to like? Well, honestly, not much. Uh, I just have one minor gripe. Uh, maybe we won't even call it a gripe, but it's definitely something that you want to be careful of. You see, anytime you have a lot of magic going on behind the scenes, there's always a chance that someone will not be aware of what's going on and the magic happening under the hood. You know, they're not going to be aware of it. And this can sometimes lead to confusion. So for example, just the other day, one of my students was working on an embedded project with this make file right here. So there's a lot here and I'm not gonna go through the whole make file, but it's mostly just a lot of different variables, things that I've talked about in previous videos, just basically mashed together in a slightly more complicated example. But the point in terms of what we're talking about today is that this project used to be a single file project and then that was expanded to include a few additional 
files. And as I mentioned before, there are a lot of variables and compiler flags that happens quite a bit in project, especially I found in embedded projects. And if I come down here and if I run make, if I make it, other than a couple of warnings up here, it looks like it worked. You know, things compile, uh, you know, they all, all these compile statements look about like what I would expect. I'm getting a binary produced. So it looks like what I wanted. It looks good from here, but it didn't actually compile things properly. And the reason is if we come down here, the main compile rule right here that compiles the main program wasn't updated to match the new files. But instead of giving an error, you know, instead of saying something like there's no rule to build this, it just used the built-in rule. And because we were redefining things like C flags and L flags right here, what I ended up getting, the rule that I got was actually really, really close to what we wanted. In fact, if you come down here, unless you look really closely, you cannot tell that it's using the wrong rule unless you're really, really careful. And of course, the problem is, is in programming really close often isn't all that helpful. And in this case, it actually meant that it took us a lot longer to find the bug than we expected because what we were looking at looked almost right. Like it looked right. And so it took a while to realize what was actually happening. So that's one case where the built-in rules, maybe they weren't my favorite things in the world, there are times where a really good error message is a wonderful thing. It really gets your attention and tells you something's going on that you didn't expect. And I'll leave it up to you whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, but whether you love them or hate them, I hope you learned something new today. Now you understand how automatic rules work in Make, how to find out what they are and how to use them in your programs. Please like, subscribe, click something on your way out, and until next week, I'll see you later. Happy coding.